non-ferrous means everything except iron well except mostly iron and those are the um, steels cast iron stainless steel that's considered the ferrous metals everything else is non-ferrous so even if you went to a metal recycling place they have a tendency to say well ferrous it all goes there non-ferrous somewhere else and, and you'll find that the ferrous pile is the biggest pile even though there's only one metal that's because iron is cheap and strong and useful and the only disadvantage of iron is that it's heavy and it rusts uh, and you can even get rid of the rusting problem with stainless steel but these are uh, here's a quick list of some of the other metals that we'll be looking at um, we have aluminium of course that's the number two metal steel is number one number two is aluminium and then we have all the copper based ones that will be definitely number three so it's including pure copper and then the copper alloys like brass and bronze then you've got nickel alloys you've got zinc and all the zinc alloys the applications of zinc such as galvanizing tin mainly used in tin, tin plating and used in alloys lead titanium magnesium which is uh, pretty much in competition with aluminium but it's lighter than aluminium and then you've got metals uh, with high temperature such as tungsten and iridium the precious metals like gold platinum silver palladium blah, blah blah and you've got special metals that have tricky things about them like uranium which is super heavy and yet radioactive stuff and mercury which melts so it's molten looks like molten lead and it's very heavy all right so if we just quickly look through some of these you can see some of the um, properties and what they're used for aluminium uh, is a and as a matter of fact once you get used to these metals you can you, all those silver ones you can actually see the difference in just by looking at the color of it and you can tell the color of titanium compared to the color of stainless for example it's, titanium is a darker gray and you can tell the color of aluminium compared to stainless even if they were both polished the aluminium is a whiter silver than the stainless the st stainless is a grayer silver um, but after that it's a bit hard to tell <coughs> from aluminium and silver and platinum and all the other white silver metals but certainly those three you can you can uh, get used to aluminium stainless steel and titanium are quite distinguishable by their grayness well so aluminium is a silver white so it's a whitish silver very really bright silver soft malleable which means malleable means compression so you can hammer it it conducts heat and electricity it's corrosion resistant by the way aluminium um is not super duper corrosion resistant so uh, it's very corrosion resistant only because it gets an oxide layer on it but if you get through that oxide layer then it's pretty hopeless so what it's really bad at it's bad at corrosion when there's a rubbing so if there's any rubbing what we'll do we'll rub off the oxide layer and then they'll corrode again and it'll rub it off and corrode again so that's the the action that rubs the surface off is called fretting so if you had maybe a bolted joint that's um, just moving all the time just a little tiny movement and the water can get into it then uh, you can have corrosion you can also have corrosion um, with aluminium um, electrolytically as well so if you have two sheets of it and they're slightly different um, composition then they can set up a uh, electric current and that can cause corrosion so uh, aluminium or white while it's not corrosive you can you can bet um, plenty of money that uh, you'll find corrosion on an aircraft and it's aluminium that's corroding it's um, the main problem cracks and corrosion and the uses for aluminium is ridiculous pretty much anything you can think of is uh, a potential use of aluminium including even car bodies and boats and obviously planes even ships completely aluminium ships so uh, probably the only thing you don't see aluminium is um, steel structures they're not really switched because they don't need to save the weight aluminium alloys now um it, you hardly ever use pure aluminium the only time you'd use pure aluminium is for electricity or for super ductile things like uh, foil and wire you can get fairly close to pure aluminium most of the other times we mix aluminium with other elements we'll look at that a bit later 
and uh, that makes it a lot stronger and then you can do more useful things like uh, you know automotive parts and bicycle things and high performance aircraft stuff that's made of aluminium that's been strengthened copper copper is uh now the co copper is a very red color very unusual um color actually so not many metals and anything like the color of copper um so it's a very red shiny all the metals are shiny but copper is a red shiny color and um it's tough and it's ductile it's got a fairly high melting point so um and as you know it conducts electricity so we use copper as uh, the conductor copper wire and you can stretch it really well which is handy because it makes it easy to make wire so you just pull on it and stretch it thinner and thinner uh, so electrical wires are out of copper brass is an alloy of copper and mixed between, mixture between copper and zinc so when you mix zinc with the copper uh, you get brass and that's a stronger element than copper and it's also good for casting and uh, doing other things now by the way that 65 35 that's not the only brass you can make that's just one common one um, for castings or there's another type of copper which is more ductile uh, for forging and that's uh, got more copper in it than this zinc and that's um, for making things that you forge rather than melt there's lead as you know lead's that heavy metal soft very soft and very heavy and resist corrosion it's also used in batteries so that's a big use of it and zinc um, that's uh, sort of a little bit like aluminium but heavier and um, it has a good corrosion effect especially in the presence of steel because the corrosion aims for the zinc instead of the steel so it protects the steel by eating away at the zinc uh, and that's called galvanized when you galvanize something you you're putting a uh, zinc coating on it to prevent the steel from being attacked and then there's zinc alloys which you mix uh, the zinc with other metals to um, give you properties which are usually higher strength and you can do castings in zinc alloy which are better than aluminium alloy because um, zinc is easy to use lower melting point and also aluminium unfortunately scratches the mold because aluminium oxide is very abrasive so as it's melting it instantly makes oxide layer as soon as it touches oxygen and that scratch goes in and scratches the mold so it does wear the mold out and so you know you get a lot more shots you probably get two or three times as many shots from a zinc mold as you do aluminium molds uh, so it's just bad luck you have to make another mold when it's worn out tin is another metal um, don't see much of it other than for use in alloys like bronze and solder and uh, but you do use it for coating so the coating a very shiny very thin coating um, like in tins like fruit tins in so on the inside um, and the outside that's tin plated and titanium last one there that's um, got a famous name but it's not really uh, as amazing as people think it is it's just relatively it sits relatively in the middle between aluminium and steel so it's not as strong as steel it's not as soft as aluminium um, it's lighter than steel but it's heavier than aluminium uh, and at all together it would be in the middle except it's um, better at temperature than the middle so it can handle temperature not as much as steel though so it doesn't be steel in anything except uh, strength to weight it's slightly ahead the strength to weight it's only slightly ahead but it is ahead of aluminium and steel uh, but what's what it's good for is strength to weight and corrosion it's got very good corrosion resistance excellent better than aluminium better than be even better than stainless stainless steel all right should have mentioned stainless steel in that table shouldn't I? but we can't because this is non-ferrous all right how much metal is used here's some pretty old numbers from 1998 hmm that time we found some more but you can see steel is way higher than anything else 766,000 thousand tons so 766 million tons versus um, 30 
minion comes. It's crazy. And we've got some prices which are all out of date. Um, just give me a rough idea of sort of the prices of things. Here, copper is fairly expensive compared to aluminium. Lead's not that expensive. Molybdenum is really expensive. Some of these metals that they have to put into steel to, to make the steel better, some of them are nasty prices, like they're just about precious metals. Um, and molybdenum, you can see, is um, pretty high. Nickel goes up and down heaps, and that's another one that affects the price of stainless. Because if nickel goes up, here it is at 938, then stainless goes up, and then nickel goes down, and stainless goes down again. I think it's pretty cheap. In uh, America, the coins, they still have one cent coins, can you believe? But they're making out of zinc. The coin's actually made of zinc, it's just got a thin copper plating to look like a copper coin. So they're very cheap. Otherwise, they would be worth, the metal would be worth more than the one cent. And in America, you're allowed to melt coins without going to jail. Of course, they don't live in a country like Australia. All right, um, I didn't say anything. Alloys. Alloys are mixtures of metals. You know, you're allowed to squash your coins in America. You don't get in trouble. They even have little machines where you, you put your coin in and it rolls the coin and turns it into a little medallion or something. Crazy, eh? If you do that here, you get in trouble. Alloys are mixtures of two metals, two or more. And the reason we make alloys is pure metals have two problems. First of all, pure metals have the highest melting point. And secondly, pure, pure metals are the softest. So once you mix two metals together, that tends to get harder and it tends to lower the melting point. Perfect, because if it's got a low melting point, it's easy to make. And if it's harder, it's good. So that's why we hardly ever use pure metal. We never, we hardly ever see pure iron or pure, um, all, all of these metals. The only time, like, you're never going to see, one thing you won't see is pure titanium. Yeah, that's a, that would be a rare thing. Unless, I guess, you're trying to make some sort of pressed, pressed housing or something. The only time you ever get pure is you need really high ductility or very good electrical conductivity, like copper. The rest of the time, alloys. All right, so that's what all that says. It says um, when you mix them, it's better. Here's an example of mixing two metals together uh, from 0 to 100%. And the two metals in this case is tin and lead, both of which have ridiculous letters. Tin is SN, so completely no relation to tin. And lead, which is PB, which is also unrelated, and that's because these metals were discovered a long time ago, back in the Latin days, and they had Latin names with, with PB, which stood for plumbium, which is where we get the word plumber from, because plumbers used to work with lead all the time. Now that, nowadays, they hardly touch it. It's glued plastic together, or click plastic together. And, um, and tin, the same thing, that, that's been uh, around for a long time. Tin, uh, tin metalwork has, has been uh, ancient from ancient days. So once again, that comes from probably the Latin language as well, but I've got no idea what the word is. I suppose you can Google it. That's why some of the metals have letters that don't match the name. Whereas aluminium and titanium, which are both new metals, have aluminium AL, titanium TI. Because they're new, magnesium, etc. All right, now what's going on here is a chart which shows that as we increase the percentage, so we're starting at 0% tin on the left hand side, and we increase the amount of tin until we get up to 62% tin. So about two thirds of it's tin now. And then we keep increasing until we get 100% tin. Now, what's the melting point of tin? 232. What's the melting point of lead? 327. All right. So if you've got pure lead, you need to get the 327 to melt it. It's going to be pretty hard to do that in your oven at home. That's pushing it. Um, if you have tin, 232, you should be able to do that in your oven, in the kitchen. Just get a tray and put some tin in it and turn it up, turn it up in the oven. You'll have molten tin in your kitchen. That'd be fun. If you can find enough tin, it's not that easy to get. It's actually not even all that cheap tin, you know. You would think tins would be really cheap, but it's not. It's not like lead 
So what happens here? The temperature is 183. That's the melting point of solder. If you mix 62% tin and 38% lead together, it melts at 183. How cool is that? So guess what? They do it on purpose. They get tin and mix it with lead at 62 to 38%. And that, way, and that way, when you get a soldering iron, the soldering iron only has to get it to 183, and it melts right here at 183. It goes from liquid to solid instantly. So it's freezing. You can, you can watch it suddenly freeze from uh, liquid to solid at 183 degrees, <clears throat> nice and low, so that you can do it with a soldering iron without burning all your electronic components to pieces or burning all the insulation off your copper wire. <clears throat> All right, now this is an equilibrium diagram. This is giving plenty of time for things to happen. 183 is the temperature where everything becomes solid. Whereas here, it's liquid. Now it's going mushy, so it's starting to go solid. And then it can finally go solid at 183. We're not getting a solid transformation now. We're not going face in a cubic to body in a cubic. doesn't happen here. It just stays all the same structure all the way through. It's just gradually forming the structure. We've got excess lead on this side excess tin on that side whereas we go right at the middle which is the eutectic we have a perfect combination of tin and lead just like perlite is a perfect combination of 0.83 percent carbon it's actually a little bit closer to the 4.3 percent cast iron actually and so eutectic is like cast iron all right now what's actually happening when you're making one of these charts is if we were to go, for example, at um, at one of the, say, this temperature here, the green one, and we're up here at this temperature, you know, maybe um, 327 or, or above, and as we come down, we're cooling down until we hit, at about 250 degrees, we hit this line, and now we're starting to make solid. So at this point, we're making some solid and still less some liquid around. Eventually, all of our... Um, our mixture has cooled down to 183 and then at 183 is forming this solid here so everything's becoming solid so it has to stop cooling until everything is solid it can't go below 183 because that's like the freezing point the freezing point of the um the mixture the 6238 mixture which is the eutectic mixture and so until that eutectic mixture has fully hardened it can't go under 183 once you get to 183 Everything's that grain now can cool down from further. So this little step here is telling you that there's something important about 183. That's the temperature that the eutectic melts at. And that's explained. What I just said is explained there. This is what happens when you write on the eutectic, the 62-38 percentage. It's coming down here. Nothing's happening because it's liquid, liquid, liquid. It's liquid all the way. Liquid, 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 liquid. Bang. It has to go straight from liquid to solid right at 183. For that to happen, it's not allowed to go below 183. It can't until everything's frozen. Then it can come, get down. So this classic curve with a dead straight line and then cooling down is the eutectic. So it basically has to freeze at, at an instant. So this is what happens when you're soldering. You melt the solder with the soldering iron. It's liquid, liquid, liquid. And all of a sudden, while it's cooling down through here, it, it freezes quite suddenly. And that's exactly what happens with solder. If you're doing electrical work, you'll notice the solder. You can actually see it freezing over. It suddenly becomes, uh, loses its glossy look and turns into like a silvery uh, blob instead of a glossy blob that looks like mercury all right now here is see we weren't quite telling you the truth we said it was this simple not really that simple it actually looks like this so this <clears throat> but it's the same general idea we have as the liquid line along the top and that's the liquid line and then this 183 is the temperature that the um, eutectic has to be formed by and we've got we've got the eutectics uh, drawn in here so here we have pure eutectic. That's kind of like the equivalent of perlite when we were doing back in car iron carbon. And so if we, we come down with this alloy here, which is like the one we saw before, 
We're starting off 100% liquid, so there's no structure at all in liquid. Now here between B and D, we're making some of this new eutectic mixture. So the eutectic is starting to form here at C, and then we get more and more of that stuff in um, at point D. And then <clears throat> the rest of the liquid is now got to turn into the other eutectic, which is eutectic beta. So they call them alpha and beta because they're two different structures. <clears throat> so we have the alpha and beta structures all all seen together here at the eutectic. Okay, so it's sort of similar to the iron carbon diagram, except it's simpler because it's only going from liquid to mushy to solid. There's no second transformation from austenite to another solid. <clears throat> And there, there it is again. We just got some uh, percentages there. But what happens? That happens in here um, is that lead actually turns into a um, a different phase. There's the alpha phase and the beta phase, which is tin. Alpha is lead. Beta is tin. And then eutectic is a mixture of them. Alpha is lead, beta is tin, and you can have eutectic, which is a mixture of lead and tin, which happens to be 63, what was it, 62, 38, 62% tin, 38% lead. All right, now not all equilibrium diagrams are nice and simple like that. That was a nice easy one. As you know, we already did the... Um, Iron carbon, which is quite a lot more complicated. Here's um, some other ones that form compounds that have two eutectics. So there's one here, and then there's another one over there at a different ratio. So it's not so complicated, uh, which happens on the magnesium tin and the magnesium lead. So you would never think those two would mix with you. All right. <clears throat> so that sort of just covers some of that um, equilibrium diagram stuff that sort of rounds off from what we did last week. But the first real metal that we're going to be visiting is aluminium. And of course, uh, aluminium usages are in just about every area, from food to building, transport, and electrical as well, as well as just standard machinery. So um, here's percentages of, of those different areas, uh, mostly transport, which of course uh, includes all the aircraft. Building construction, there's plenty of aluminium going on there, um, especially with windows and um, insulation and whatnot. Packaging gets a big use there. Aluminium, um, even very, very thin aluminium, is um, packed into um, cartons and things. Electrical usages, um, consumer goods, which is, um, you know, like an iPhone. For computers and stuff, machinery and equipment, and the other is 8%. Now, aluminium is, first of all, you can separate aluminium into two big classes, and that's whether it is casting or wrought, which is forging. So if you're going to roll it, that's a wrought one. If you're extruding it, that's wrought. But if you're going to melt it and then pour it into a mold, that's cast. So Pretty much every aluminium mixture or alloy is designed either for wrought forging or casting, casting alloy. So we'll separate, we'll talk about those two completely separately. Here's some common aluminium alloys. Not you don't need to memorize these, of course, but um, quite um, wide ranging what, what uh, a particular alloy could be used for. So um, it takes a bit of experience to know what's the best aluminium for a particular job. So something like 6061 is a pretty standard kind of aluminium. Um, <clears throat> Pretty strong, it's weldable, does does most sort of jobs pretty well, like it's pretty standard sort of thing. 
Uh, you can get other ones which are for more um, sort of specialised, like 7075. It's a heat treating one, and it's used for like aircraft and sports equipment and things. It's kind of considered to be a higher grade. Um, but the numbering is based on this little table here. So this will probably give you the first good clue into getting your head around the aluminiums. And um, it start, it's, this is based on the American system. So America kind of controlled the aluminium progress because since the Second World War, um, America did a lot of aircraft stuff and aircraft ran the aluminium research. So we've, that's why everyone's following American numbering system for aluminium. Well, just about everyone. All right, if it doesn't have anything in particular, then it starts with a one. Um, if it ha starts with a two, then it's a copper based one. So copper is the main ingredient. Manganese for three, silicon for four, magnesium for five, magnesium and silicon for six, zinc for seven, and lithium for eight. And there's another one which is uh, casting alloy. They notice the lithium ones not being used for casting, nor is the manganese. So these are forging ones, or wart, as they call it. All right, we'll just skip the rest of that table. We don't really need to know everything about it. The other thing about aluminium is the hardness of it. And they have um, letters for them and um, how, of how hard it is. So um, these are the symbols here. You've got H12, H, da, 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 and it tells you how hard it is. <clears throat> All right, now it should probably be best to show an example. So here we've got three, 3103, right? That's the alloy itself. It starts with a three, which means it is a manganese. 3103 dash zero. Well, usually we see a dash zero, it means it's uh, not going to be hard. And it's a soft annealed condition, so that's soft. Dash zero means it's soft. But if it said dash H16, that means it's three quarters hard. So the hardness is three quarters of the way there. So strain hardened, three quarter hard. H18 is strain hardened, fully hard. So what does strain hardened mean? It means work hardened. So like if you were rolling it or extruding it, pulling it, drawing it. You're doing some sort of distortion to the metal and you keep distorting it until it can't handle any more then you've got it fully hard. You have to anneal it to go any further. We saw that in the video, uh, grain structure video. They had to roll the aluminium, then they put it in the oven to soften it so they can roll it some more. And they've got different ones partially annealed and stabilized. Blah, blah, blah. Right, now, this is the busy section of aluminium. We're going to explain what's the difference between hardening steel and hardening aluminium. And I probably need a little drawing for this. Okay, now there's this phrase, or there's this term called age hardening. It doesn't mean hardening of the arteries, it means that the metal goes hard by itself. How weird is that? So imagine this, they, they got some aluminium, they quenched the aluminium, and uh, it's soft, couldn't go hard like steel does, oh, that's pretty useless. They put it in the shed, come back a couple of weeks later, and it's gone hard, how weird. So what on earth happened? This is how you harden aluminium. You quench it, which makes it soft, well, which doesn't harden it, and then when you leave it, it goes hard. And interestingly, it goes hard for exactly the same reason that steel goes hard, it's just a different process. Okay, so it's for those uh, steels there, uh, aluminiums I should say, 
So those for aluminiums, two, four, six, seven, eight series aluminiums that can be heat hardened, not strain hardened. That's the other way to harden. Two ways to harden, remember, you can harden by heating it up and causing a structure in the grains that stops slip, or you can harden it by strain hardening or work hardening, which uses up the slip and that stops us any more slip happening. So there's two ways to harden something. So age hardening is also known as precipitation hardening because it causes a precipitate to form within the metal. So here it says in the second paragraph, in the second line, it says it relies on changes in solid solubility with temperature to produce fine particles of an impurity phase, phase which impedes the movement of dissipation defects in crystals, later, which impedes slip because of that in metals. What was all that about? Let's have a look at what that, this means. Watch this. This is what you do to harden aluminium. First of all, you get yourself some aluminium, but it's not allowed to be pure aluminium, it's got to have stuff in it. So you start off with some aluminium, right? And you mix into the aluminium some stuff. Let me say we mix in ingredients to make some let's say let's let's do this with colors let's say we've got um some red stuff and yeah, maybe it's cop i probably shouldn't i probably shouldn't i should do it and we got, say, some blue stuff. And what happens when you get red and blue and mix it together? You get purple, right? So you can get some purple. I get the red stuff and the blue stuff and mix it in with the aluminium, let's say that that's white. And when I've done that, I'm going to make purple. I've just got red and blue all mixed together into my aluminium to make purple. That is when it's hot. I'm totally experimenting with this lesson now. So I mix my red ingredient and my blue ingredient to make purple, and this is when it's hot. Now, it turns out there's so much red and there's so much blue in this mixture that the aluminium would not be able to handle so much of these ingredients there's too much stuff in there so it's a bit like when you've got too much carbon in the steel and it can't handle it and it has to make perlite because it, what's going to do with the carbon or if you go too fast it makes martin salt well here because it's hot it's okay so while it's hot it's okay to be mixed together it's quite happy when it's hot but what happens if I get this metal and I quench it? It's supposed to be the same shape. And I cool it fast, rapid cooling. When I do a rapid cool, all of those bits of red and green are mixed in and it cools. So they're stuck in there. So that red and that green are still in the mix like it was before but there's a problem it's under stress so yes we froze those excess ingredients in there but now when it's formed a solid well, it was a solid, but now that it's been quenched, it's gone. Those those bits of red and blue are under stress in here, so it doesn't like it. Now, over time, it takes a while, those stressed bits of those two ingredients start to mix out of the 
mixture. So let's see this is now change a different color. And our red bits are starting to dissolve out of the solid, not liquid. It's moved. The atoms are actually moving in the solid. They're just migrating their way along and making little bunches, little bunches of red blobs. So we're getting... We're getting blobs of the red stuff coming out and making blobs. And the blobs of the blue stuff. So that so and sometimes they're blobs of the red blue stuff. And whatever blobs we happen to be able to make are popping out of the mixture and getting in the way of the crystals. So what's what was a mixture is now getting impinged. So now it's really hard for slip to happen because we've got all these obstacles in the way. So how can you do split when you've got all these um, bits of ingredient having come out of the mixture? That's called age hardening. So we trapped our ingredients in the we trapped them into here. So these have been trapped. But they're not happy. They might be trapped, but they're not happy being there. And so over time, which is called um, age home, those ingredients start to come out. And so these little blobs are going to get in the way of slipping. So this stops slip. And stopping slip is equals hardening. When you can stop slip, you are hardening it. And this is called precipitation. Precipitation means, well, we, we use the words of precipitation from rain. Precipitation. Precipitation hardening. Precipitation means you that you get something out of it's like getting something out of thin air. So you get water droplets out of water vapor. So what used to be air vapor turns into water droplets. That's precipitation. So here we had what we what thought was what we thought was a nice even mixture, which it looks even, first of all, but over time it starts separating out and these um, uncomfortable atoms are making structures inside the grain, and those structures are going to cause slip to um, be halted and be able to slip. So this is the um, how to harden. How do we how do we harden aluminium? There you go. Let's go through that again. We start off with aluminium, right? And we have too much of some atoms that aluminium doesn't like. But when it's hot, it's okay. It can mix in. So we melt it all together while it's hot and uh, it's happy. But then when we rapidly cool it, we've trapped those ingredients in the aluminium, which looks okay. The material is still soft, 
So at this point, the aluminium is soft. It's still soft here. But then over time, the ingredients that were trapped in there start to come out and make little blobs all the way through the grain. And these little um, pockets of, of structure, atomic structures, inside the grain uh, are the thing that stops slip from happening because slip requires a lot, sort of a lock of line to go through. If you're trying to create a line through here, you're going to smash into those slips and you can't do a slip plane, so you can't make it move. You can't make it slide across that plane because you can't draw a plane through the grain without hitting one of those blobs in the way. So there you go, that's age hardening of aluminium. Now, there is a, um, a thing called solution heat treating where you can do exactly the same thing, but you can speed it up. This is um, super complicated. You go, you can make the time faster by making it hotter. And that's difficult to understand. There you go. So we can go, we can wait for a couple of weeks for it to happen, or we can do it in a few hours by going hotter. It's faster. So this is. So this is solution heat treating. So they've got all these fancy names for very common sense sort of things. Solution heat treating. Which means warm it up and it will age quicker. Solution heat treatment. Which don't want to warm it up too much, otherwise you end up back here. It's too hot. So funnily enough, solution heat treatment kind of resembles tempering in, in steel, but no, it's nothing like tempering. It's just a, it's the hardening process. In fact, this section here, the aging process, this is what this is. This is aging between that point and this point. That's aging. The aging process is the equivalent of quenching in steel. So this has got a pre, so the quenching traps them and then the aging hardens. Whereas steel, the quenching hardens directly. So there's an extra step with aluminium. You can speed up the aging process by heating it up, warming it up to, uh, to increase the speed of the, of the um, aging process. But still the same idea. It doesn't change anything. It's just makes it look faster. That's it. So you quench it, it's soft. You think, oh, that was a fail. Then you leave it and wait and come back after even weeks and it's gone hard. Now they kind of discovered that um, around about the time of the Second World War, they were playing around with uh, zinc based aluminiums and they found that they called this uh, aluminium duralium, a hardenable aluminium. And, um, and that was one of the things they found that that hardening process can be sped up if you warm it up, um, not real hot, just like 100 degrees sort of temperatures, nothing like boiling 400 or anything. All right, now we have some letters for temperature um, heating. So this, these H's are for hardening by strain, work hardening. If you're hardening by temperature, it starts with a T, which kind of makes sense. So like, that's why I keep saying temperature, but I don't say heating, because that would be very confusing. Because the H is for doing lots of work. I don't know what it is. H. Strain. H for strain. Hmm. Um, it's probably standing for hardness. And T is a temperature, a thermal way of hardening. So with T1, we do this. T2, we do that. They're not really exactly in order. It's not like they get harder as you go. The numbers are bigger. They're just different styles or ways of um heat treating. So let's say a T6, for example, is solution heat treated and artificially aged. Solution heat treated then artificially aged. Let's see if we can understand that sentence. Solution heat treated and then artificially aged. 
that would be h6, no, t6. Do we understand what that means? Whoop, that's too small. There we go. Yeah, we can do this. this is easy. Solution heat treated. And then artificially. Right, now the solution heat treated bit. Let's change colors. You can see ourselves. Solution heat treated means. Solution heat treated. Solution heat treated. Not that bit. Means that in fact this is solution heat treated this is a solution heat treated the solution because it's got things dissolved in it so this is a solution heat treated we heated it up with the extra ingredients and then we quenched it to trap those ingredients and we did a solution heat treatment Right, then artificially aged, what's that bit? The artificially aged means we left it for a long time, but we heated it up so that it would go quicker. So that was a sped up age hardening. Artificially aged means it was warmed up aging. Plus products which are not cold working. No, I'm not talking about cold working. We talk about heat treat. Now, one of the funny questions that pops up is, what happens if you heat treat something, then you solution, sorry, you solution heat treat something, and then you age it, right? Let's say you aged it for two weeks, and then you send it out to the job, and uh, and then it's, it's sitting there for six months. What happens if over those six months it goes even harder? Or what if it goes too hard? How do you know it's not going to keep on getting harder and harder and harder after you've finished it? Well, that's kind of one of the trickier parts of aluminium. It's a bit more tricky than working with steel. So you don't know for sure. So one of the things that you, what they do, one of the things they do is like this one, overaged or stabilized T7. So what you're doing there is you're artificially aging them to, um, to give you, uh, you're overdoing it to make absolutely certain that you have um, the hardness that you're expecting has been applied. So you, what you don't want to do is you don't want to half harden something and then send it out and then it's on the job it's going to sit there getting harder and harder and harder. It would be aging itself. So that would be very confusing. They're the sorts of problems they had uh, when all this started um, decades ago, back in the last century, trying to get the thing to harden correctly and not go over hard, which can happen as well. All right, so the, there's there's your designations T's for temperature and H for strain, strain hardness. A uh, few more reasons why you put different alloys into the aluminium. Um, as you know, we had different ones there for the number system, but we didn't have any number system for some of these, which are also added to aluminium. Notice there's no iron, but we do have lead. And boron, some unusual boron is quite a big molecule. Lead's, uh, atom, lead's a massive atom. Mag magnesium, of course, we know you, you, you can mix uh, magnesium and aluminium together. Uh, silicon's a surprise, eh? Like, because you can put silicon in. Yeah. Silicon's a funny non metal that does act like a metal sometimes. All right, here are the classifications for the wrought ions um, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 which we saw before. <clears throat> um, these are those T, remember that we said T3, T4, so here they are in, in all of their um, different possible ways of doing it. It's quite a big range there. We've got some extra ones for whether they've been cold worked as well. So you could have some solution heat treated as well as the cold work, you know, a mixture of the two. 
And here's some common uh, wrought alloys uh, mentioned here, <clears throat> which we saw in an earlier table, a little bit more comprehensive here. Now, switching over to the casting aluminiums, these are the ones that you design for melting and going into a mold rather than for rolling them or extruding them. So when we're casting aluminium, we have to a different property. We want it to melt, we want it to be very thin when it's liquid. Uh, as a matter of fact, when you're recycling aluminium, you do want to separate the casting from the forging ones uh, because they are quite, they can be quite different in their ingredients. So um, you're better off if you separate them like that. A gearbox housing would be in a casting aluminium, but you know, extruded windows would, or um, drink cans would be a, a wrought aluminium. Although drink cans are pretty pure and they're, because they're very ductile. But they're in the wrought category, not the cast category. All right, and the other thing about um, casting aluminium is, of course, you're trying to get a low melting point usually, so you can cast them more easily, but you're also after high strength. So um, depends what what um, properties you're after. And here's a classification for casting alloys. <clears throat> We're um, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, so just like we had before, that doesn't quite match. There's some matching. There's the 7s, there's, there's the zinc etc so it's pretty similar here's some examples of casting alloys so um, <clears throat> casting um, obviously uh, you want strength and hardness okay high temperature properties that can be important for um, aluminium Weldability, that's another another issue, whether this thing can be welded, if it's repairable, let's say it's a uh, head gasket, can you repair it, can you weld your head gasket, and get it going again. <clears throat> There's a bit of uh, detail in there, like globular microstructure, which is fine and uniform, it's, it's a bit of a funny term, we probably won't be digging into every little detail in here. It, um, but they're just referring to the grains themselves are um, not all over the place in size. They're trying to be small, fine. We always want fine grains. And uniform, we want the grains the same size, which is always a good thing. We don't want the grains all over the place. Commonly used for cast wheels, for example. Aircraft, pumps, tanks, marine hardware. So fairly large parts of part, large mouldings, castings. Don't forget these are all casting too. <clears throat> the, the ways that we cast is very important in the choice of the alloy as well. So if it's done under pressure inside a metal steel mould, or is it done in, a, uh, in an open casting with just gravity, or, you know, different ways of casting will determine which alloys we use as well. Most often we try to cast aluminium into a pressure die cast steel mould, and that way we get the very best surface finish. All right, now just looking at the different ways of casting, we can have um, permanent mould casting, which typically be a um, metal mould, but it's only under gravity bed, gravity pressure, so there's, not, there's no high pressure in there. Uh, usually because they're larger and not having very high quantities. The disadvantage of that one is that it's usually a lot of waste and you have to cut it off and remelt it, not that that's a big problem, but it's not, it's not for very high volume. Sand casting is when you, well, there's no other way to make it than with a sand cast, like uh, you've got interior holes, like an import manifold, that the, the sand has to be uh, broken away because you wouldn't be able to have steel on the inside, you wouldn't be able to get it out. Um, <clears throat> that's the main reason you would use sand for aluminium. And then there's die casting, which is a, a straight out steel mold, which in, in which the uh, aluminium is cast under pressure, pressurised casting of the aluminium. Now we see some of these in processing videos in the next chapter, the, the casting process of aluminium, called aluminium die casting. 
So die casting is the equivalent of injection molding in plastic, but using metal. And you get very good surface finish. You can go nice and thin. Uh, you can mold, you know, like computer housings or parts for phones. Uh, very, very, very thin fractions of a millimetre thick sometimes. Um, but the disadvantages I mentioned with aluminium, it does form a surface oxide, which can scratch the mould and cause it to wear out after a while. Um, there's some properties of different types of um, alloy grades. These, these are the different grades here, and their tensile strengths in inches. I'm going to add one thing on to the end of this chapter with aluminium, and uh, that's anodizing. What is anodizing? Anodizing means um, making a layer on the surface so that it doesn't corrode. Now we anodize aluminium because when we anodize it we're increasing the oxide layer. So normal aluminium might look like Here's your aluminium. And then on the surface of the aluminium, there's oxide layer, very, very thin oxide layer. And that happens because the oxygen attacks the aluminium, they have a chemical reaction and make aluminium oxide. So the oxide is aluminium oxide. And once you've got an oxide layer on there, that protects the surface underneath from corrosion. It doesn't work. I mean, you try and do it with iron. You have Fe in here, and you make iron oxide here. The problem with iron oxide is it lets water through. So the water gets in to the rust, and then water gets under here, stays in here, and does some more rusting. So this gets thicker and thicker and thicker and thicker. Until you end up with this huge flaky rust on the surface of the steel. If you keep getting water in there, this rust is going to keep growing until you've got no iron left. So oxide, iron oxide, doesn't help to stop iron from rusting. And aluminium oxide does because the aluminium oxide layer is a lot stronger than the iron oxide layer. So this just makes this turns your iron into red dirt. Whereas the aluminium oxide is very thin, it's only microns thick. Now, the idea of anodizing is the first thing you do is you make a thicker oxide layer. You deliberately make aluminium have a thicker layer. So you thicken up the oxide layer. How do you do that? Acid. You chuck, you chuck it in a bunch of acid. nasty acid and that makes it more oxide layer so you get more and more reaction happening and this ends up being thicker and that's it there you go you can sort of tell aluminium that has had oxidation done to it because it's got a sort of a white look and slightly hard surface so if you try to scratch it it'll make a crackling sound you get like a scriber or something in sharp point and run it along the surface you get a crackling sort of sound um, so a lot of uh, fittings and um, like indoor furniture, window frames, not, not that there's many silver ones these days, were uh, are done like this to protect the surface, make the surface harder. So that thicker oxide layer makes it harder, stronger, longer lasting, more uniform. <clears throat>
and that's about as strong as the really right way. But it's definitely harder and more uniform look and it's more um, robust as well. It doesn't sort of scratch very easily. Scratch resistant. Right, and guess what else? Because you've got this thick oxide layer, you can also color it. You can go, well, now that we've got this lovely thick layer, we can color it by putting a dye into the thick oxide layer. And we can color it whatever color we like. We can do gold, or black, or blue, or red, etc, etc. Whatever dye we can find. Red, we can do titanium grey. Oh, we can do gold, let's we'll see. I suppose we can do green. I can't say I've ever seen any green. Probably can. So that's anodizing. So it's a two step process. First, you've got to make the oxide layer thicker and, and uh, yeah, thicker than the natural, natural layer. So it's a thicker layer which makes a hard surface. But that hard surface also takes the dye nicely and uh, you, you get that dye to penetrate that oxide layer and uh, you get that colour stuck on the surface of the aluminium makes the anodized aluminium so you'll, you'll always be able to tell because it's got a, got a hard surface now how thick they make it is variable they can vary that as well so there's good there's good anodizing and bad anodizing and likewise with the dyes as well some dyes might fade and whatnot so <clears throat> there's there's a quality issue about how well the anodizing is done of course uh pretty toxic chemicals they use in there as well so um the acids and stuff that are going to eat the surface of the aluminium is going to be pretty nasty stuff all right moving over to copper now so main thing about aluminium is that the, the hardening is um, kind of reverse it's the same principle but how it happens is in, in reverse you quench it and then it hardens itself Hardening. Copper is a probably not, uh, the next metal down in the list. Uh, we're going to start speeding up now and just whiz through the, the main highlights of these metals. Um, so as you can see, wire rod is 55% of it, so that's going to be electricity usage and plumbing stuff. So um, <clears throat> by the time you got rid of electric electricians and plumbers and um, and all electric motors and things that's where all the where's where all the copper goes um the other portions of copper is alloys like brass so electrical wire plumbing pipe and alloys by the time you've done that you're in about 80 percent of it so copper's biggest use is electricity uh, making electrical wire and uh, copper gets the choice because for its conductivity which is very good it's the cheapest metal because the only one that's better than copper is silver which is stupidly expensive it's actually a precious metal so um, we're not going to use silver wire very often they do actually use wire made out of silver sometimes like high performance electric motor could have silver windings how's that cool eh because it conducts electricity better than copper. Maybe, uh, you know, electric motors in a spacecraft or something. <laughs> okay, copper gets used in uh, construction, transport, electrical applications. And um, it also recycles really well. So uh, when it when it gets remelted, copper finds its way back to recycling you know, very well because of its high price, of course. Aluminium also recycles really well. The metals, all these metals, particularly the non ferrous metals, uh, recycle really well. It's like aluminium's got a 70% recycle rate, which is amazingly high. And a very, very um, successful recycling um, program for recycling metal. And, that, and one of the big reasons for that is metal recycles much better than plastic. You see, every time you recycle plastic, it's not as good as it was before. It degrades. It starts to burn and and disintegrate. And so you have to keep adding new plastic in to, to help the plastic to stay um, genuine. But with metal, 
but every time you melt the metal, you're back to where you started from again, all over again. So um, it's just the same as the fresh stuff. So recycled aluminium, you can recycle infinite number of times. Just slowly lose it to oxidation, that's about it. It's only very thin, micron thick oxide layer, so it's not that much oxide. They also use copper as a bit of an indicator for the um, the direction of industry because when people are um, doing manufacturing, if their manufacturing is going up, they tend to order copper because if you're doing a lot of manufacturing, there'll be a lot of electric motors involved and, and electrical um, super you know, infrastructure. So the, um, the demand for copper is an indicator of... Um, how well the industry is going to go in the next six months. So stock market people keep looking at copper to see if there's a rise in copper demand, that means that people are purchasing for manufacturing, which means manufacturing is looking like it should go up. It's called the copper, there's a, there's a name for that, using copper as an indicator for um, predicting the stock market. Of course copper is absolutely essential and it's only getting even more so with electric cars and whatnot. All right, next one, zinc. Look at that, 57% galvanizing. What's galvanizing? That's plating steel with zinc. So you put a layer of zinc on the steel, which prevents the steel from rusting uh, while the zinc's there. So the zinc takes the oxygen instead of the steel taking the oxygen. And even if you scratch through the galvanizing, the galvanizing has enough of an effect to even prevent that scratch from going anywhere because the zinc takes the oxygen off it. Well, the other percentages are a little bit similar to copper uh, when it's mixed in with brass. So, of course, um, that's the other half of the copper that we saw in the previous one. And die casting is another part of zinc. There is a 14%. That's when you mix zinc with other alloys to make zinc casting alloys. Now, we already looked at aluminium casting alloys. Well, we can use zinc for casting as well. And we can make extruded and rolled products, mostly uh, sheet zinc, uh, which is used for flashing mostly. And um, you could make, make things out of them like containers and whatnot. Right, so zinc is... Um, um, pretty common metals, not super expensive, pretty uh, easy to come by. And most countries have a re reasonably good supply of zinc. Australia's good. Um, so we export zinc. <clears throat> zinc plating is the main thing. Just with zinc plating, there's multiple ways you can do it. But the, the two main ways that things are zinc plated is they're zinc plated by hot dipping or they're zinc plated by electrolytic plating. So the way you can tell, the hot tip is much thicker, like about a tenth of a millimetre, there it is, 100 microns. That's thick zinc. Whereas the electroplating is only about a tenth of that thickness, so it's about 10 microns thick. Um, and it's usually nice and shiny, looks nice and silvery and clean, but it's not very good outside because it's going it's to wear off pretty quick and then, then the rust will start happening underneath. Whereas the hot dip galvanized, because it's so thick, that'll re remain rust free um, more than 10 times as thick because uh, it'll last for a long time. So um, now the, there are um, things like color bond that are done in a factory that use a, a sort of hot dip process in the system, but it's very, very thin. So they get a highly um, controlled hot dipping so it's not ridiculously thick and rough. Uh, like when you hot dip it, hot dip galvanize a, a trailer, a car trailer or something, a box trailer, um, the zinc is uh, pretty rough and if you paint it, you won't, it's not going to get a, a nice glossy finish. But um, the color bond is uh, hot dip galvanized, but in a very controlled process. So you still have a smooth surface. And it's very thin as well. All right, so hot dipping takes a temperature of around 450 degrees. So there, there it is there, 435 to 460. Um, and you, you put the metal, which is steel, 
inside a bath of molten zinc and uh, and leave it in there until uh, it's happy and then bring it out and you've got to make sure that you're not going to trap zinc in in the object otherwise you'll have a big blob of solid zinc in there which you get charged for so you've got to make a hole and let all the zinc out uh, if you had pipes and things like that you make sure that they fill up the zinc pretty heavy metal too it's not heavy steel but it's a lot heavier than aluminium Electroplating is um, mass production of bolts and things like that. Much lower corrosion resistance than hot dip. There's a few other ways to put zinc on as well. You can spray it on and, um, and fling it on. And share it on. Spray it on, sort of melts the zinc and sprays it onto the surface. And you can paint it with zinc as well. You just have paint that has zinc particles in it and does the same job. Um, zinc, there's one mention about zinc too, uh, one of the dangers of zinc is that um, the zinc oxide can be toxic, so welding zinc plated um, steel is dangerous, particularly if it's in an indoor environment without circulation, um, and it can build up suddenly and it can actually kill people. It doesn't build up in your body though, your body can get rid of the zinc oxide fairly well, it's just that can, you can overload it suddenly and uh, it can be very dangerous. People actually die of that. <clears throat> but it's not, it's not like um, mercury and lead where it builds up in your body, um, zinc is quite a bit safer that way. Alright, now alloys. These are the alloys that you mix together to make a zinc die casting alloy. And if you look at the percentages of everything zinc plus this other stuff, so it's mostly mixing in here with aluminium, copper, uh, magnesium, there is about 3%, 8%, 6%. So, so these different alloys got uh, various amounts 4%, 3%, 8%, 6 so around. So all, all together, uh, typically sitting around about the 5 to 10% of other ingredients like aluminium and copper. And the melting point, the all important melting point is oh here we go. So uh, three three ninety, three eighty, three ninety, three, three seventy-seven. So the melting points are pretty good, they're not not too high, pretty easy to cast when you only have to go to um, under four hundred degrees. Much easier than aluminium, which is quite a bit higher. They used to do a lot more zinc die casting than they do nowadays. So they've gone over to aluminium to save weight. And also they've gone over to aluminium because people are scared of that toxic um, zinc oxide thing. But that's really only a problem when you're welding because you're going way too hot. When you're, when you're cooking at 400 degrees, you're not going to make any zinc oxide because that zinc oxide is, is boiling the zinc, not melting the zinc. So you see this white sort of powder. Uh, when you when you burn when you burn the zinc, that's that's when you're making zinc oxide. All right, silver. Silver is a precious metal and has some industrial uses as well. Mainly, I've already mentioned that is the best conductor, better conductor than copper, and better than gold, by the way. So why do we use gold for electrical stuff then? Why don't we use silver? Well, it's they've both got something good about them. Silver conducts electricity best. It's the best conductor you can get. So if you have a piece of wire and you want the most electricity for the thinnest wire, the material to use is silver. But if you want to make a plug that you're plugging in and out, the best material to use is gold because it doesn't oxidize. Gold stays shiny. Even silver oxidizes, it ends up going black. So um, Copper oxidizes, it goes to brown. And stainless steel already oxidizes because that's stainless steel. Aluminium's got an oxide layer on it. Titanium's got a massive oxide layer on it, so they're hopeless for a plug. But you want a material that doesn't have an oxide on it, and the best one for that is gold. So gold is better as a contact for a plug, silver is better as a wire for conducting. 
So, do you want gold plated gold wires in your sound system in your car? No, it's not going to be fine. Gold would be for a plug. If you want to make better wire, you can use silver, solid silver wire. No, can't see why you just can't just have a bit more weight in copper there. It's going to do the same thing. They used to use um, silver for photography, that was film processing. Well, that's just about completely gone now, apart from a few um, diehards, I guess. You can see the photography is going down, down and down, it's probably down a lot more now. <clears throat> Used for a bit for investment, so that's for silver as well. It's gone back down again. Oh, do that that one. Okay, silver is the best conductor. It's also used in printed circuits. Silver paint that's another one that you can make conductive paint using silver particles in your paint um, and contacts and switches. They, they still use silver nowadays in switch gear where they have a high current switches that have to handle high currents in, in small. Um, you know, small sections, they have to use silver to do that, and they have silver tip switches to start engines and things. Um, another place where silver is used is in catalytic converters in cars. That's annoying use, so, although they have other metals in there as well. Silver's also got very good light reflection, so it's, um, when you polish it, it's better than other metals. Plus, it doesn't oxidize like silver does, which loses its gloss. It's used in soldering and brazing as well so there's a whole area called silver soldering which is like a low temperature brazing so uh, brazing is melting brass in between the, the steel um whereas silver soldering is melting silver uh, silver alloys in between the steel so the silver alloys um use uh, lower melting points than the brass so they for example steel steel um, push bikes were silver soldered so that it didn't uh, damage the steel as much as brass would and there are some silver batteries as well which you um, don't hear much about anymore nickel nickel is a bit of a special metal it's um, very high corrosion resistance so uh, you can get pure nickel things you can also nickel plate things as well that's quite common it's kind of looks like chrome it's a slightly different silver it's not a bright as a chrome so a bit hard to tell the difference and if there's this other side the slightly more gray look to it um about most of the time nickel is used as an alloy particularly used in stainless steel as we mentioned the 316 is eight percent nickel and um it's also used in lots of different sorts of alloys uh, and the super alloys which are high nickel content um, and the nickel steels which are which are using all the steel mixtures of nickel is where all the nickel is getting used up and of course you've got nichrome batteries uh, nichrome wire as well which is um, nickel and chromium obviously uh, which is almost like saying stainless steel but it's not the same percentage that's um, heater wire electrical heater wire so if you want to make a heater wire just get some stainless steel wire it works good enough and there's nickel brasses and bronzes, and there's even nickel cast irons. There we go. <clears throat> so here's the uses for nickels, mainly stainless steel, as I mentioned, 61% in the stainless steel. And electroplating is quite commonly used in the process of electroplating. You might put the nickel plate underneath the chrome, stuff like that. So, um, but it's uh, often used as a substitute for chrome. Um, a bit easier to work with and chrome is it's um, virtually you know you can't tell a difference unless the side by side all right tin now we have mentioned tin a couple of times already tin is mainly used as a plating so here's our uses here um, and so tin plate there it is a third and solder it's used in solder mixed with lead uh, to make solder we can't get away with solder without solder so uh, it gets used a lot in solders tin has a low melting point 
I finally used the tin is t uh, float glass. I use tin window glass on top of a molten um, pool of molten tin. And that's why it's called float glass because the glass floats on the top of the molten tin. And the reason I do that is because they don't need to have the glass touching any metal, which will put a, a, um, a rough surface on the glass, and that way the glass can be um, dead flat, perfectly uh, smooth on that side. And you have to touch the top, of course, so you can make glass nice and smooth without touching it. It's called the Pilkington process, they made it up. So that's how they make make flat glass. In the old days, you used to make glass by um, extruding it, and then they had the big grinding wheels that would grind the glass uh, flat and uh, polish it until it's clear. So this is way easier than back in those days. That's why glass is a lot cheaper now. Lead. All right, lead is the heavy stuff we know about um, having a high weight, and it's also used in um, bullets, fishing sinkers, a lead sheet for um, preventing sound transmission through walls, um, radiation sh shielding, for example, in an x-ray machine, um, and for weight, putting it at the bottom of the, of a, of a sailing boat, um, and, and weights and balances on the car wheels. Although we've got other materials we can use there. Um, it's low melting point makes it really easy to make your own sinkers and make your own stuff. It's also low melting point. It's good for lead tin solder. And um, you can use it to make the sculptures and things nice and easily. Um, the problem is that it is a bit on the toxic side, so we don't really like people running around making sculptures out of it. Uh, it's often used in a lot of metals to help machining and help makes machining easier. So you have lead in brass and things like that to make make uh, the metal work better on, on a machine tool. It's used a lot in electrical things for um, batteries, you know that one, um, and for um, joining, so soldering. <clears throat> Uh, and as I mentioned, it's added to brass and steel to, to uh, help free cutting. Make it. What happens is the, the lead melts, and so the, the metal pulls away easily. Lead's very ductile, so you can make sheets and you can and hammer it into shape. So it's really good for flashing if you have a complicated shape you have to make. Out of lead, you can sort of hammer it into that shape. Um, <clears throat> lead is um, often being banned nowadays. Um, so they try to avoid lead in things like lead pencils. They were lead pencils because they used to have lead mixed with graphite, but it's got different now. It doesn't have lead in it. Uh, so here, the uses of it, the big percentage, of course, is battery. So uh, that's where the lead is. Titanium. Titanium is a misunderstood metal where people think it's uh, magic metal that does everything. No, it isn't. It's sitting almost exactly halfway between aluminium and steel. It's 40% lighter than steel, but 60% heavier than aluminium, so it's um, not even halfway. It's a bit on the heavy side. Uh, but because it's so reactive, it's more reactive than aluminium is, uh, it makes a really strong oxide layer on the surface, so that helps to prevent oxidation. And but it also means it's a bit hard to do things like welding on it because it's so reactive. So you have to have a very good um, exclusion of air from titanium. You don't want to have a molten um, bucket of titanium and start pouring the titanium out in the air because the titanium will want to react with the oxygen. So to do Casting for titanium, you have to melt it inside a controlled vacuum, like a um, argon atmosphere or something. Now it's got a high strength to weight ratio though, so titanium, and it's uh, pretty good for its temperature as well. So um, aluminium's big downfall is temperature, so it can't handle much heat. So uh, you're much better off using titanium if it's starting to get hot in that area. 
So we've got a bunch of different um, alloys. <clears throat> Once again, pure metals aren't used because they're soft and high, high melting point. So uh, we nearly always use uh, mixtures of titanium with other metals. And there's quite a few ingredients that go in there. There's a bunch of different atoms in here. Look at this molybdenum, zirconium, nitrogen, vanadium. And some pretty rare, unusual metals that you hardly ever hear of, like columbium. used for um, all sorts of stuff, um, cryogenic applications, airplane parts, chemical processing. The reason it gets used for chemical processing is so it's so non-corrosive. Um, prosthetic devices is a beautiful example. So the reason it works well inside the human body is it won't react. So not many things do that. Even stainless steel is not good enough to be inside the human body uh, permanently. It's okay for a while like stainless steel screws and stuff, but they really should be taking them back out again because they're not going to last um, forever. Uh, the only things you can really put in your body forever is gold and titanium and platinum. Well, everything else is going to start reacting. Magnesium as the light version of aluminium. It's also more reactive than aluminium, so once again, a bit like titanium, it will explode if it's um, mixed with oxygen while it's melting, molten, so you'd have to protect the um, <clears throat> the molten magnesium from oxygen. Give it a bit of a, yeah, it's not, not as explosive as titanium, but it still uh, still happens, still does react. Um, but the good thing about magnesium is so light, so uh, it does get used, and it's always been increased amount of use of magnesium taking place of Aluminium when they can because it reduces weight, motorbikes and sports equipment. A bit more difficult to use though than aluminium. Alright, well, there are a couple of videos here, not super duper important that you see these. Um, this one's the uh, history of metals, which is pretty basic overview. And the making of aluminium, which is almost the exact opposite. This is a fairly comprehensive video of how they make aluminium, uh, Australian video, and very interesting to watch. It goes into more detail than we'll be um, doing here in this chapter. So um, these two videos, this is a little bit too low, and this one's a little bit too high. We'll put links to those videos in the in the page, but um, not quite as essential watching as the other ones earlier. All right, so that's about it for the aluminium, zinc, copper, titanium, and lead and tin chapter, non-ferrous metals.